Welcome to History at High Noon for the month of May. We're so excited today to have Mr. John Higgs come speak to us about the history of radio stations. Come on, John, talk to us. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think I know most of you folks, but those that I don't know, I am John Higgs and I'm in the radio business. I'm glad to be here and I also happen to enjoy history and appreciate what you guys do with uh, preserving history in Coffee County. When it comes to radio, the part I know best is the last 40 years because that's the part that I've been a part of. So that's what I'm going to focus on mostly today. <laughs> The rest of it is a little bit of hearsay, but it's hearsay that came from some pretty good sources. People who had lived it before me that I worked with early on in my career that passed along stories. So what we'll start with is in the pre-radio days in Coffee County. There was a governor that Dr. Cottingham and others can tell a lot more about than I can, but his name was Ed Rivers. He was a South Georgia governor, a rare thing pretty much. And from what I understand, his gravestone is still over in Lakeland, Georgia, and you can see it from the road if you go into Valdosta. But Mr. Rivers was an enterprising young man. He started off in another part of the state and ended up moving to Milltown, Georgia to pursue a career. And Milltown later became Lakeland, Georgia. He had a variety of jobs there in Milltown as a, as a young businessman and attorney. He had one position after another. Pretty soon it moved to state representative for his area. And then later on, he became the Speaker of the House and just kept moving up. Well, the Talmages, who ruled Georgia at the time, had gotten, had butted up against something. They had butted up against term limits. And so he could not run for another term, from what I understand, and from what Wikipedia says, at least. And so Mr. Rivers from Lakeland kind of jumped up in there and fashioned himself as a more progressive candidate for the times. And he was more progressive in that he was more for the New Deal kind of stuff that was coming down the pike and for government assistance to help rural folks in South Georgia and other parts of the state and to be for rural electrification, which was, I don't know how that could be controversial, but back then I guess it was. Some folks didn't want electricity coming to their areas. And so the, these things propelled him into office. He became a governor from out of Lakeland, Georgia. And in the process over time, they say it's not what you know all the time, but who you know. Well, political people are, are well connected and whatnot, and they get maybe some opportunities. So Governor Rivers later on became the owner of radio stations. One of Governor Rivers' close aides, let's say, maybe he was a comrade, I'm just guessing, but he was from Homerville, Georgia. So Homerville and Lakeland being right nearby and probably getting together about political things and things going on for South Georgia, he became an elbow rubbing friend with a dude named Downing Musgrove. So Mr. Musgrove, you might recognize his name when you go to Jekyll Island the next time and you start down the causeway and you look over there and it says the Downing Musgrove Causeway. It's a pretty important road in our state. So I figured he must be a pretty important guy, but I, I knew very little about him, so I looked him up. He was out of Homerville and Clinch County. And Mr. Musgrove became a state representative at, at one point. He also was the Comptroller General of the state of Georgia. And he was right there as the executive secretary for Governor Rivers for his term. I don't know exactly what an executive secretary did back at that time, but it sounded like a pretty important position. It was probably somewhat akin to chief of staff today. So he was well connected. He also was the representative or delegate for the Democratic National Convention for 20 straight years in Georgia. So he, he had a lot of good connections. Somehow or another, radio stations after World War II began, began to have possibilities in rural areas. Before then, it might be a far off station you're listening to, like Atlanta, Chicago, Cincinnati on the AM radio dial. But then it became possible for counties and cities to have radio stations in rural Georgia too. For example, over in Fitzgerald, we have a radio station called WBHB AM. And that station, I learned after we bought the stations, 
came from Welcome Back Home Boys. That's where that came from. So that's when it came into being, was right after World War II. Towns like Fitzgerald and Douglas could start having radio stations. So back to the connections, I believe through the connections they had in government and whatnot and, and people in place, when the government started handing out these licenses, somehow or another, Governor Rivers got the license, but he got it through Downing Musgrove. So Mr. Musgrove got the station, and that's where the name DMG comes from. WDMG was named as the station, and it came from Downing Musgrove. So that's how our radio station got its name, from that politician and state worker. Mr. Musgrove also had a nephew, and his nephew was named Brody Tim. And Brody Tim became a resident of Douglas and Coffee County at one point. Many of you might remember him. He lived in Douglas for a good long time, and he was instrumental in starting, or, or I'm not really sure, or reconfiguring the present country club building out at the country club. He was like the head of the committee for that. So he was active in Douglas, his family was here, and he was a resident of Douglas for a long time. Well, Mr. Tim did several things. He started radio stations in Warner Robins, Georgia, which I was familiar with from being in the radio business at the time. He started radio stations in Tallahassee, Florida. One of them was named after the college there, the historically black college there, A&M University, Florida A&M. It was W-A-N-M was the name of the station and it was a college oriented station. Then he had a big powerhouse station called Gulf 104. And Gulf 104 still is a powerhouse station in North Florida and South Georgia. If you're ever over around Thomasville and even over toward Lakeland, you can pick it up and all the way on, way on the other side of Tallahassee, it's a big powerful station. He also was instrumental in starting Douglas Televiewers. Many of you remember Douglas Televiewers being the only cable source for however many years, 30 years probably. And I think that if I had to guess, a lot of his money came from Douglas Televiewers because that was a very good profit center for him. Radio, maybe a little less so, but he did okay and on all fronts. But with all those businesses he had, he decided to relocate to Tallahassee, Florida. So he relocated to Tallahassee and he began Tim Enterprises and had a big office down there that I visited a time or two. Mr. Tim was so well known, what impressed me, I'm a big sports fan, so the first time I go out to South Georgia College, now South Georgia State College, to interview Bobby Bowden. I was a young pup and I was all excited. I was like, Bobby Bowden, this is big time, you know? So I went out with my tape recorder and I was standing there waiting and I said, uh, I'm with WDMG Radio. And he said, well, how's Mr. Tim doing? <laughs> so he knew right off that Mr. Tim owned the radio station locally. And he knew Mr. Tim from Tallahassee and all that. So he ran in some pretty big circles, Mr. Tim. He was a very, very wealthy man and uh, did well in the radio and his other concerns. When he moved to Tallahassee, he had the need of a local manager. And this is a little bit of a gap because I'm going back in time that I don't know about. But from what I heard, it was somewhere in that time that he hired a lady named Mary Gerard. And many of you remember Mary Gerard. I visited her house recently over in Broxton that overlooks the elementary school there, kind of an old schoolhouse, 100 years old. It's a historic building in its own right. Well, Mary Gerard, from what I understand and from hearing from people who worked for her, was a very fair but strict manager. She did a good job, ruled with an iron fist at the radio station, got things done. She managed very well for Mr. Tim in his absence and did so for a number of years. In the 1970s, I believe she retired and she later became the mayor of Broxton and, and pursued the other things in life that she did in the latter years of her life. At that point, they had the need for another manager, so sometime before, they had hired a man from North Georgia, around Madison, Monroe area, and his name was Roy L. Jones, Jr. Roy was a good announcer, mainly, from up in that area. I'm bringing out my phone for a purpose here. I'm gonna hopefully play something in just a moment. But Roy was an announcer up there mostly, but he came down here with an open mind as to what he was gonna do with his career.
On his first day, they had what was called a teletype machine back then, and it would rattle off news and whatever was happening. And so you were supposed to do as an announcer what's called a rip and read. So you rip the teletype, you go over, when the song ends, you turn it down and you go on and read whatever it is that was said. He had never been to South Georgia, and so first thing he did was, was a rip and read his first day in Douglas. And he took it and started reading, and he said, in news from Alapaha. <laughs> he told me that story many times. And he didn't know that it was called Alapaha. He had to learn that through trial and error. I, I gave that story at his eulogy just a few short years ago. That was one of his favorite stories. But Roy also was a salesperson. Back then, WDMG, and I brought this sign, I don't think passing it around will be an option because it's kind of heavy. We found this sign some years ago. It used to sit out on Highway 32. I don't know how old this sign is, but it's very old. This sign boasted about 5,000 watts that WDMG had. Because back when they got WDMG, they got the largest AM station that there was. And digress just a moment. My ex-father-in-law, who's now late father-in-law from Baxley, Georgia, Mr. T.E. Padgett, was growing up in Graham, Georgia in the 1940s and 50s, and he said that everybody listened to WDMG over there, especially during the tobacco market things and stuff, because they wanted to hear what the tobacco was going to bring, because Douglas was so big in the tobacco market, and they would listen to all kinds of things from over in Graham, because there that, weren't that many stations, and there weren't that many big stations like WDMG. So, Roy made his living mostly, he announced some, but he made his living selling. And he used to tell me he would go to Robert's Milling to sell my late great uncle who owned the store back, and that was a long time ago, because he died in 1960. So, back long before then, he would go sell him advertising. He would sell in Lakeland, Homerville, Alma, Baxley, he sold the whole region. He was the main salesperson and he made a pretty good living doing it. But when Mr. Gerard decided to retire and move on to something else, he was elevated to the manager of the station. And something that happened before I came along that was pretty big was the advent of FM radio. FM came along actually some years before that, but Douglas was kind of slow to the table. And along and along, Mr. Tim decided he would spend some of that money and he would create an FM radio station for Douglas, Georgia. So he did so at 99.5 on the dial and WDMG FM was born. I'm not a real technical person, but just to give a little bit of an illustration of what we had, we had the largest power station that you could have as an FM. That was 100,000 watts. So we had the 100,000 watt FM, the 5,000 watt AM, the largest for this area that you could have. But for whatever reason, Mr. Tim decided to put the FM station back when he built it in the 70s onto a tower that still stands out on Highway 32 when you're heading by and the, and the Garage Mahal mobile unit over on your left, you'll see there's a taller tower than the others. And that was the FM tower, about 300 feet high. He decided to put it on that. Others in the area, such as over in Baxley and in Moultrie, they decided to put their towers on 1,000 feet towers, which they were allowed to do. But Mr. Tim, I don't know if he was trying to save money or making money in other places and didn't care. He just put it on the 300 foot tower and FM is through line of sight. AM is a complicated matter that I, can, I still can't, I can't understand today. <laughs> but you gotta put wires under the ground radials. You've got to put wires under the ground and those wires have to be attuned to the frequency that you're on. Then it has to be put on the tower too so that the whole thing acts as kind of an antenna. With the FM you got one antenna on the top and that is line of sight. So the higher you are, the larger your coverage area. It's supposed to be the larger your coverage area, the more money you make. So the more listeners you have, but for whatever reason he decided to keep it at that. And that's when he hired a group of people that I mentioned only because I worked with them and loved them and they're my friends and that's when my career sort of started in the radio. It's before I actually started work with them but I was well aware of them. 
he had the longest lasting FM radio crew that I can ever remember for any station that stayed the same for years. Usually you have people coming in and out. You might have a morning guy stay for 10 years, but the afternoon guy leaves, etc. They had four guys. Some of you might remember some of these names. Carol Thompson was in the morning from 6 to 10. A guy named Arthur Hutto was on from 10 till 3, and he had the unforgettable nickname of Road Hog. <laughs> You know, the deepest voice you ever heard. So three to seven was Rick Jones, Roy's son. And then from seven to midnight was Walter Minix. So that was, the, that was the crew. Now on Sunday, Mr. Gerard's friend who started some years before, probably when Mary was managing, was Gene Cummings. And Gene stayed on for decades in the same position on Sundays. So they had the same crew month after month, year after year, until 1982. And this is when I entered the picture. So the Coffee County Progress was looking for an editor. First, they needed a reporter. And I know John's in the newspaper business for many years, so I'm a recovering newspaper man myself. So, <laughs> so back in 1982, I was hired as a reporter, I thought. So I worked about a month, and Rodney Ragsdale decides to run off to the Army, which was the plan all along. And he says, by the way, you're the new editor. And I'm like, I've only got a month's worth of experience. How could I be the editor? He's like, I don't know, but I'm going to be gone, so good luck. So I had to learn everything, the, the dark room, the editorials, delivering the papers. We had to actually do it and deliver it, putting it together, everything all at once, which was fine, except for a few months later, three of my paychecks bounced back to back. The first one was, oh, okay. The second one was, mm, this is getting rough. The third one was, man, I got to do something different. So, so I, even Mr. Lee at Harvey's, you might remember, he wouldn't even cash them anymore. <laughs> and so, so I was desperate. So I said, I've got to do something. And then somebody said, well, Rick, Rick's going back to school at Georgia Southern. So I said, really? He said, yeah, he's leaving to go back to school at Georgia Southern. So I applied for and got Rick's job. The first change in that format or in that uh, repertoire of announcers in seven years probably was Rick Jones leaving to go back to Georgia Southern. So I got the coveted afternoon shift back in 1983. About three years later, I was starving to death, <laughs> uh, trying to pay bills, trying to get married and things of that nature, having kids. And I got an offer to be the city editor of the Wake Cross Journal Herald at an increase of pay and all that. And that was what I had trained for in college and also I thought, well, maybe I would like to get back in the newspaper business. So I interviewed, I told Roy I was leaving and he said, well, before you leave, let me just say to try one thing. And I said, okay. He said, go back and try sales. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't think I want to do sales. I'm, I'm the quiet type. I like to sit behind the scenes in that dark microphone. I don't, I don't you know. He said, well, just try it for a month. And if you don't like it, then you don't have to do it anymore. And you can just, I, I give you my blessing. You can go to the newspaper business. So I did it for a month. And for some reason, things were working out. People were buying. The sales went up pretty, pretty well. And it just kept going up. And so my paycheck went up commensurate with the increase in sales. And so I really didn't want to leave Douglas. I wanted to stay in Douglas. I'm from Pearson originally. It's my home. And I just wanted to stay in the area, so I did. And looking back, that was, that was a big moment for me to decide to stay in the radio business. Moving ahead, in 1996, in the history that I remember very well, in 1996, a guy named Raymond Furman came up from Florida and bought the radio stations from Mr. Tim and Mr. Tim's family. I think Mr. Tim was about to pass away or had passed away. So I had to basically re-interview for my job after many, many years in the radio business. I managed to stay on. Roy decided to retire from the radio business and uh, we moved on. What I did not know is that 300 foot tower that I referred to earlier was going to come back and bite us. Because what happened was Raymond knew when he came up from Ponte Vedra and bought the stations and got the billing built up and all, he knew that that station would move under the law of the government. 
And he knew that it would move and become a 1,000 foot tower. And he knew that would be attractive to an outside buyer. So he already had it in his mind to flip it, kind of like you flip houses. He was already going to flip the radio station. None of us knew, but he did. So after only three or four years, Raymond did so. He sold it to a concern out of Daytona Beach. They bought the stations not because of Fitzgerald or, or Hazelhurst or Tifton or the, the stations that were around. They bought it because they knew they could get that big station out of there and move it to Valdosta, Georgia. And it would become worth a lot more as a result. So I was in a predicament. My main bread and butter was 99.5. Couldn't sell the AM anymore at that point. So what was I going to do? I had to change careers. And I thought, well, there's a little station in Osceola, Georgia, 97.7. Perhaps we could move that station, 97.7, to Douglas, and it would be 97.9. And we could make that WDMG. Not as big a station, but at least we would still be represented with a radio station that would cover Coffee County and the surrounding areas. So the new bosses went along with that plan. We moved that station back in somewhere around 98, I believe, and that's when 97.7 became WDMG instead of 99.5. And so that's part of our history. In, or it might have been 2000, it was somewhere around there. After that, I started hearing rumors again that they were going to sell the stations again. Another sale, another job interview, having to reapply for my job again. And so I thought, I've got to come up with another plan. So I came up with another plan, found three people who had some means about them in Coffee County, friends of mine, and they said they would be interested in investing and in buying the radio stations. So in 19, let's see, it was 2006, rather, we bought the radio stations and we called it Broadcast South, and that's when our present company was formed in 2006. In a couple of years after that, I found out that Mr. Hewlett in, Hazel, in Hazelhurst, Georgia, was wanting to sell his stations and retire, so we bought Mr. Hewlett's stations, and like Raymond, I knew that that station would move, and so I bought it with the express idea that we're going to move that station from Hazelhurst and we're going to put it in Nichols, Georgia. And we're going to go from 25,000 watts in Hazelhurst to 50,000 watts in Douglas. And while we won't have a 100,000 watt station, we will have a 50,000 watt station, the second biggest allowed, and it will bring back a big station to Douglas. So that's what we did. I didn't want to leave Hazelhurst undone, so we went to McRae, bought a small station in McRae, and moved it to Hazelhurst so it would cover Jeff Davis County. And that station's now called WHJD, which stands for Hazelhurst Jeff Davis, and it's on the air today. About two years after that, there was a dude named Matt that went over to what was then Freedom 1019. And he was like a gnat on the elephant's back. We had a lot of stations. We weren't worried about him. But all of a sudden, he started creating a furor. <laughs> Everybody was listening. He got new cars riding around, wrapped. He's got all the attention going on. And so Gene Walter, my partner at the time, and others said, let's just buy him. So we called the guy in Chicago that owned it. He was amenable to selling. So we bought the Pearson station, which was Shine 1019 at that time, and that added that station to our repertoire of stations as well. We roll along to today, and some things have changed. My partners were in it for an investment, and so I decided to go to the Small Business Administration, and they were amenable to let me buy their part out, which I did so last October. So, so now I'm the owner of the stations, and I appreciate their help and always will for what they did to allow me to be in that position. And another man, a man from Waycross, Mr. Troy Maddox, who owns the radio stations over there, he's 74 and he wants to retire. So Mr. Maddox approached me about buying those stations and so on August 1st we're going to change hands and what's known as Maddox Broadcasting is going to come into being and it's going to be the Higgs Multimedia group is going to be under a different company, but we're going to add three more radio stations to what we presently have. There was a need as time went on for radio to integrate into today's world more so, maybe with some visual, maybe with more internet, 
stuff going on. And so about three years ago, Robert Preston and I hatched a plan to come up with DouglasNow.com. And so that's been in, in place for three years now and it provides news. And we kind of work back and forth between the radio and Douglas Now to be more involved in that. I mentioned Roy a moment ago. Would I be correct in saying that everybody in the room has heard Roy Jones's voice before? Everybody? Well, just in case, I wasn't sure. But what I did was I found a commercial that Roy did. And I, last year, I had him break it back out and put it on the Trojan football broadcast. It was for J&T Tire Company. And John Coffey really enjoyed hearing Roy on there, and he wanted to run it again year after year. So, Mr. Yeah. Farmer, for you, time is money. So you don't want to lose valuable downtime because of tire trouble on your tractor, truck, combine, and on the market lawns. You can depend on J&T Tire Company and their best, fast, efficient repair service. This is also true for industry and all of the farm-related businesses. On tire service in town and in the country. <laughs> There's nobody's voice like, like Roy's. I'll always remember the first day I was ever on the air. If I'd have been flying an airplane, it would have crashed a couple different times. It was everything was going wrong, and Roy came walking in to do some production, and I kind of tentatively said, "Roy, how was it?" And he he didn't look at me; he just looked down, <laughs> and in that deep voice, he said needs work <laughs> so that's as nice as he could be you know, at the moment but I, I could say here today without Roy Jones I wouldn't have what I have whatever I have I wouldn't be in the position I'm in and I always be appreciative of what he did for me and hiring me a newspaper man to be a part-time radio guy back in the day as far as highlights just to talk about that for a moment and finish up there's some things that have gone on in my career since I started, and I hope Gene Wade is going to come speak soon. Next month. Next month, and he's going to speak more to the programs that occurred in the 60s, the 50s, the 40s that some of you might remember and recognize. I don't know them, but a couple of things that I wanted to mention before I close. One of them was the Southern Serenade that, that Roy did. Many of you remember that program. I remember it quite well growing up. Joy, you probably wouldn't know of it, but <laughs> John, John, you either probably. Del Cook Lumber Company. Yeah. yeah, but Roy went over to Del Cook Lumber Company in Adel, Georgia, and sold a guy named Waldo DeLoach. He told me the story so many times I got it committed to memory. In the 1950s, I think. And they decided to come up with a program which had gone with the wind music behind it. And then in and out of that gone with the wind would be some poetic, romantic kind of southern prose in Roy's deep voice, which would kind of close out each day toward twilight. And so when I was coming up in Pearson, I would be aggravated at 18 years of age. Ah, oh, here's that program again. I would really want to hear it. But as that time went on, I began to more so appreciate it for what it was. It was a program that it was historic, I would say. And in a history meeting, I think that we would say that was a, a show that was an historic part of Coffee County. It was here for so long. And even in my day, up in the 80s, he would have me once a year play this old tape. It was all gnarly and old, and he would, he would break it out. And I'd say, oh, no, it's time for the Waldo Deloach program again. And, so, <laughs> and he would say, I want you to go on and I want you to play this 30-minute program, which is a tribute to Waldo Deloach. And one day I said, Roy, Waldo's been dead for, for 25 years. You know, how long are you going to play this? And he's like, well, it isn't as much as for Waldo as it is for me because I appreciate what he did for me because them doing that program made a big difference in my career and life, he said, and I want to show appreciation by playing this. And so once a year on the same day, I would play that 30 minute program, which was like the Southern Serenade, but it was a kind of a, a gone with the wind type thing. But as far as highlights in my career that I would like to point out that happened right here in Old Douglas, the biggest one, probably as far as making the news and being nationwide, actually occurred in Pearson when the jet crashed over there. 
I was a reporter at the time. Somebody told me what happened. It was in the pre-cell phone days. And somebody said, well, a jet crashed in Pearson. So I jumped in the car, drove to Pearson, my hometown. And I look over and I see where the jet has crashed. And so I knew the man's house that had crashed. That was uh, John Walter James. And so I went up and I walked over debris and smoking stuff and fire and bombs or whatever. And I knocked on John Walter's door and I asked Mr. James if I could use his phone. And so he said I could. And so I started calling the radio station. And the second time I went to do a report, the person behind the board said, you got messages from CNN, from WGN, from, and it would just went on and on and on. It was amazing the number of people that wanted to talk to me. And so I went up and down the line calling those numbers. And, and just two years ago, I was with a friend of mine from Pearson who lives in Tampa. And he said, I was in North Carolina. I've never told you this, but I was in North Carolina at a hotel playing with the band. And I was watching CNN. And, and it came up with uh, John Higgs <laughs> up on the screen and it had your report from where the jet crashed in Pearson. So that was my only taste of national news <laughs> in the years I've been in Douglas. But as far as more cheery things, my big hero as a young man was Dale Murphy. I love Dale Murphy. I thought he was, stood for everything good. He was a great ball player, two-time MVP. He came to the Mormon church to speak. And so with shaking hands, I stood there with the, with the tape recorder and got to interview my sports hero, Dale Murphy, as he came to Douglas. From a historic perspective, probably Dewey had a lot to do with this. John Glenn coming to town was big because John Glenn was a part of American history. And, and always will be. And when John Glenn came to town through Mr. and Mr. Hayes and, and whoever else uh, brought them to town, I was able to interview John Glenn, who was running for president, and I uh, felt like I was kind of in the big time when that happened. And the other big thing for me was the Olympics, the Olympic torch. When the Olympic torch came in, I sent off for press credentials to be on the wagon that went around. Y'all remember the wagon that were here and the torch and all that? Well, they said they rejected it and said, we don't allow any radio people on the wagon. And so I wrote a rebuttal and an appeal, and I wrote it back and said, there's not a television station within 100 miles of here. There's no daily newspaper. People depend on the radio for the news, so I'd like you to reconsider. And so the Olympic Committee overrode their own rules and granted my appeal. And I was able to ride up in the wagon and then do a live remote all the way through Douglas, which is still the largest crowd I've ever seen in Coffee County. So that was quite a moment and one that I'll always remember. As far as the future goes in closing, we have a lot of work to do in the radio business. Roland does a great job. Roland Lott, I want to mention Roland. He's on every Friday night on WDMG with some old stuff. So listen in and, and enjoy. And also on Sundays, he does our Sunday programming. But we have a lot of work to do to continue to integrate between the visual and the audio. We've got to get more so in a lot of places. The main place we've got to get more so in is right here. We've got to get more so in this phone going forward. Because as y'all know, if you go anywhere in this country, you go anywhere in this world, just about. You're going to go riding on the bus down the side of the street like we did in Europe a few months back, my wife and I, and people are going to be like this, standing on the sidewalks like this. So we got to get in this phone, and we've got to do more so going into the future. We have apps so people can listen. Like if you're in a football game in North Georgia, you can listen into the game on, on the iTunes app. But there's a little bit of process you have to go through to download the iTunes app. Then you have to figure out how to get on there, and not everybody can do that. There are chips in these phones, FM chips, that are already there. But Verizon, for instance, does not activate the chips because they don't have to. It costs them money, and they don't really have to, so they don't. The government is starting to see the benefit of having the FM chips, which are already in phones, activated, mainly because of emergencies. Because when a hurricane comes to Coffee County, as was the case a few months back, Sirius FM ain't going to be doing any reports. On, on, on Coffee County. Your iPod isn't going to tell you what to do and where to go. Local radio is what's going to do it. And having those chips available is the way to help people in an emergency to be able to know what to do and where to go.
Well, that's about it. I think I went over time a little bit. The radio history continues. It continues to evolve, and we look forward to being a part of it with Broadcast South and Higgs Multimedia. And I appreciate y'all listening.